Welcome to Talking Beats with Daniel Lelchuk. We hope you'll subscribe and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Now, if you like the show, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash talking beats. We believe now more than ever in providing a platform for individuality, free thought, and a diverse range of views. By supporting the show this way, you'll get early access to episodes, bonus episodes, and much, much more. Remember, the conversation is always active at Talking Beats Podcast on social media. Here's Daniel Lelchuk. On today's program, we're speaking with biologist Oded Rechavi, selected as one of the 10 most creative people in the country of Israel under the age of 40. He has his own lab at Tel Aviv University. In his PhD thesis, he made somewhat of a breakthrough when he discovered an exception to the original cell theory formulated in 1839, when he discovered that small RNAs, something we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast, ignore cell boundaries and transfer between interacting human immune cells. His lab, which advocates for radical science that challenges existing dogmas, studies all this through nematodes called C. elegans, a one millimeter long roundworm that has a lifespan of three days. So I started off by asking Oded Rahavi what that could possibly have to do with humans. Why are we interested? Why do we want to hear about this? Can he broaden out? Can he explain? And here's what he had to say. Yeah, so indeed I work with these very simple uh, worms, these nematodes that are microscopic. You don't see them by eye. And they sound uh, uh, unrelated to our biology, but in fact they are a basic model system for studying many different uh, aspects of biology, uh, inheritance and and, uh, neuroscience and all kinds of questions. And there are thousands of people around the world that study them. So it's not uh, my idea. They've been studying, studied since the 70s. And just since the year 2000, uh, six people were awarded with Nobel Prizes for studying these nematodes because of what they teach us about um, other organisms, including humans. What is uh, transgenerational? Uh, what, what, what does that mean beyond uh, the fact that something can be carried through generations? And what does a, a deeper understanding get us? for that term. Right. So um, the topic that I study, that I focus on when I study C. elegans, these nematodes, is transgenerational inheritance. The idea that what happens to us during our life, our experiences, can some, somehow affect the biology of, our, uh, of the next generations. According to just normal biology and DNA-based inheritance, that shouldn't happen. So every generation starts as a blank slate and develops according to the genetic instruction encoded in the DNA. So what happened to you during your lifetime doesn't matter to the next generation. For example, uh, if and we know this intuitively, if you go to the gym and you build up big muscles, your kids won't be stronger as a result. They'll, they'll have to train on their own. The, just the idea that something like this would pass to the next generation was considered to be completely heretic uh, for hundreds of years uh, for biologists. But what we've shown that uh, in these simple worms, uh, some experiences do transmit to the next generations. So, for example, when you starve them, it changes the physiology of the next generations, make them live longer for multiple generations, and also make them more resistant to, to other rounds of more severe starvations. If they are infected with viruses, they produce transgenerational immunity to the same viruses. And this is very relevant, of course, now. And, um, and also uh, other responses uh, transmit. Uh, lately, we've shown, and this is perhaps the, the, one of the most in, in interesting things, that even some processes that happen to their brains, to the nervous system of the worms, transmit to the next generation so that the next generation, uh, generation could sort of be more prepared based on the experiences of their parents. And this inheritance doesn't occur because of changes to the DNA. It causes, occurs because of a different type of molecule that transmits transgenerationally, which is RNA. And there are different types of RNAs. The RNAs that move between generations are called uh, small RNAs, and they have completely different rules of inheritance that we are just figuring out now. 
address the question that perhaps a lot of people are thinking right now. Why some things and not others? Why are some things passed along, uh, like immunity to a virus perhaps, uh, and not if I spend 20 hours a week uh, lifting weights in the gym? Right. So it, the, the, I think these are speculations. This is something we're still trying to understand. But um, first of all, there are barriers to inheritance, just uh, um, difficulties to transmit certain responses because of the way that they are encoded. But also, it doesn't make sense to transmit everything to the next generation, because if the environment of the next generation would be very different, then you are preparing them for the wrong thing. For example, if I uh, uh, prepare my kids by, by changing their biological materials to uh, the environment in Israel and they happen to live in China, then they would experience a, a very different environment and wouldn't be prepared. Some things are worth restudying every time. In other cases, for example, viruses for the, for the worms, if they re-encounter the same virus over and over in every generation, then it makes sense to prepare them. Similarly with starvation, if if uh, the, the environment of the worm is such that it moves between being uh, fed to starved, to long periods of starvation and long periods of having food. So, for example, it finds, in theory, an apple, and then it takes a few generations to consume the apple. And then once the apple is, 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 is uh, eaten, they will be starved for a while, for multiple generations. So it makes sense. And indeed, uh, worms have a short generation time just three and a half days. So the likelihood that the environment of the parent would resemble the environment of the kids are rel is relatively high. Are you able to tell very easily if a, a worm that lives three and a half days has a virus? Yeah, so the, 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 it wasn't easy at all, but now the way, the way we, that we did it is we um, used an engineered, a genetically engineered virus that whenever it replicates, whenever it propagates inside the worm, it shines in green. It has a, a gene that was taken from, uh, from another organism that uh, encodes for a protein that is fluorescent. So whenever the virus is there, you just get green fluorescent worms. So in fact, it's very easy to, to monitor the presence of this virus. Take us back to your uh, beginnings, the beginning passions for science. Uh, you come from a medical and uh, scientifically oriented family, but it wasn't always what you wanted to do. Right. I'm, I was interested in other things completely. I started out uh, after the army, which is in Israel is uh, mandatory. I, I uh, went to study art in Paris. I thought I'd be an artist, a painter. Uh, and then I thought that I'll study psychology and philosophy. Uh, but the, the program that I signed into in the university had also a biological component to it. And I fell in love with biology. And in parallel, I also uh, I had a few exhibitions, uh, art exhibitions in Israel, but I, I was sucked into biology because it was so fascinating. And still today, I try to combine my different uh, uh, passions. Also, when I do, when I study biology. So in addition to these uh, studies on, uh, on inheritance in nematodes, I studied a variety of other topics. For example, I studied the, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, uh, in Qumran, and I studied irrationality, the neuronal basis of, of irrational decision making. I studied uh, brain parasites and how they could be manipulated to deliver drugs to the brain. So all kinds of things uh, interest me. And, uh, and I think uh, biology is a great platform to experiment and, and uh, try different things. Well, let's talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls a little bit. Uh, the, the sort of ancient DNA that, that you were looking at uh, it gave us increased perspective and increased understanding uh, and shed new light on the Dead Sea Scrolls, thousands of year old uh, texts. Uh, talk about that a little bit. How, how, how did you get led there? Right. So the story that how I started working on the Dead Sea Scrolls is, uh, is funny. It was completely by chance. When I just started uh, as a new professor in the university um, about eight years ago, uh, there was a retreat for new faculty. And uh, we went to dinner. And on the, on the bus, on the way to dinner, I happened to sit next to a scholar that was the, um, a biblical scholar that studies the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, to those of you who don't know, are uh, uh, ancient manuscripts found in the desert in Israel, in caves, in Qumran, uh, in the Judean desert. And they are 2,000 year old. And they are probably the most important archeological finding of the 20th century, certainly in Israel, um, because uh, they contain uh, the oldest Bible, 
The next one is 800 years older. And also other uh, texts that weren't known before the discovery of these uh, caves with, with the manuscripts. And they found totally by chance, Bedouin shepherds uh, did, uh, about 25,000 fragments of scrolls that some of them were in, in bad shape, some of them were in great shape. And, but it was a huge uh, challenge to assemble them together and piece them together because it's like trying to solve an unknown number of puzzles with an unknown number of pieces where many of the pieces are missing. And this is the story that uh, uh, Noam told me. I was completely ignorant to the scrolls until this point. Uh, and, and he is, told me that he studies them from different aspects, from the philological aspects, um, the meaning of the text and so on. And he also told me about the challenges, challenges in assembling them. And, and then uh, uh, one, uh, so I told him about my work with worms. And he told me, you know, also the, the worms are also interesting for us because the, it was found that worms dug holes in, these, in the parchment of the, of the scrolls. And people thought of using these holes to try to assemble them together. Perhaps you could imagine that a certain hole would move between different pieces. And if di different pieces are affected by a, a certain worm, then perhaps they belong together. And then I said, you know, maybe since they are written on parchment and, and uh, from animal skins, perhaps we can uh, extract ancient DNA from the different parchments and, and identify each of the, of the animals from which the scrolls were made so we can piece them together. So we can say uh, this particular piece came from uh, goat A and this particular piece and another piece came from goat uh, from a sheep so they don't belong together. But there is another piece that came also from goat A based on the, the genetic information. It's like, you know, uh, like a CSI, where they're trying to identify a, a, a criminal based on, on, it, on the DNA in the crime scene. We can perhaps use the genetic information to piece the different pieces together. The challenges were huge because the, the scrolls, as I said, are 2,000 year old and the DNA is very degraded. So it's hard to, con to obtain enough information to do this. And also because we can't just take a piece and, uh, and uh, tear it apart and extract the DNA because there are invaluable uh, um, artifacts that are extremely important and well conserved. So we had to extract enough ancient DNA from just tiny amounts of materials that the people at the, uh, uh, that, that conserved them gave us. They just scrape off a little bit of uh, scroll dust from the uninscribed side of, of each piece. And this is what we sequenced using the most advanced techniques in, in uh, clean rooms, uh, you know, wearing, wearing astronaut suits and uh, to avoid contaminations. And we managed to, to get rid of the contaminations because they are very contaminated with, for example, the, the DNA of the humans that handled them ever since. And we managed to identify matches that, uh, fragments that match and fragments that should be uh, uh, pieced apart and learn new information about the history of the scores. Um, the information, the, the, the classification of the pieces that we made based on the genetic information uh, was given to Noam, to our, Noam Mizrahi, our collaborator, who's the biblical scholar. And he told us what this tells us about the history of the scrolls and their interpretations. And completely new discoveries were made that uh, were impossible uh, to make otherwise. So I'm curious, just take us a little deeper. When you say dust, I mean, what, what, what do you mean? How, how do you collect dust from the uninscribed side of the thousands of year old paper? Yeah, so the, so first of all, we can't even touch it, the, the, the pieces. The, the people that work there at the museum conserving them and the, the Israel uh, uh, antiquity authorities, they take a little bit of a, like a scalpel, a small uh, uh, knife, and they just scrape off tiny, tiny amounts into a tube that you can barely see. And now from this uh, scroll dust, we have to extract the genetic information to sequence the DNA that is uh, within and when we do this, most of the, the DNA that we find come from contaminations because user, if humans have handled the scrolls in antiquity and also in modern times since their discovery. And in many of the photos of the people that handled the scrolls, for example, 70 years ago in Jerusalem, you see that they weren't wearing any, uh, uh, they, they weren't wearing protections or uh, they were smoking while handling them because they, didn't, they weren't aware of the risks. Um, we had to show that we can extract enough uh, DNA. And we did this in preliminary studies where we just characterize what's possible. So for example, in the old days when they just found the scrolls and they wanted to piece them together, what they did is whenever they found a, a 
two pieces that match. They glued them together using duct tape, which sounds horrible <laughs> now, but this is what they did at the time. They weren't aware. So in the, and, and for 30 years now, now, they have been removing the duct tape very carefully. And when they remove the duct tape, they put it aside next to the, the piece so that they will know from which piece they took the duct tape off. So in the beginning, we just did experiments where we tried to sequence DNA from the duct tape. And we saw that this is possible. And not only that, that we can match the DNA of the duct tape to uh, the DNA of the scrolls. We did additional, many additional controls. So for example, um, we sequenced uh, other, other leather artifacts from around the area that are ancient. Uh, so we, uh, most of the scrolls were found in, in this, these caves in Qumran, but we also collected sc scrolls from other places around the Dead Sea, from uh, multiple different locations, and also other uh, things like sandals, leather sandals that are ancient, and we sequenced these, and uh, water skins, garments, to try to really characterize this, peri this period. And uh, we also used um, modern scrolls that were made uh, for us, based on uh, presumably the, the ancient tradition, uh, so we can um, uh, try to play with them and see which uh, protocol works best for extraction of the DNA. It was a huge technical challenge that took us uh, around eight, uh, seven years to, to complete, but it was worth it because it was the most fun collaboration I've ever had for sure. And I imagine there was a little more a dialogue with your colleagues there than uh, with the worms. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's also a, a pleasure, you know, just to interact with people that are so different from you. And we're all university uh, uh, professors, but the cultures are completely different. And the scholarship of my collaborators that are coming from the humanities is just, uh, you know, inspiring. It's unbelievable. Uh, they speak 12 languages and know so much. It's really, you know, sometimes we are so uh, focused on our little worms or little, you know, molecules. Uh, and so it's really um, amazing to interact with these type of people. Well, speaking about little worms, bring us back. Now, now how much I'm wondering of what you found in these uh, microscopic worms, do you think is also at work in humans? Yeah, that, that's the, the billion dollar question, or um, it's more than money. It's just really, really important and, and, uh, and intriguing. And when, at the moment, we just don't know. I can tell you that uh, uh, these type of experiments, to do them on, on higher organisms, like even mice, not, not even humans, it's very, very difficult because you have to disentangle nature from nurture. Um, with the worms, it's very easy to do because we can control the way that they grow and live perfectly. Also, the worms are identical to one another genetically, so we can rule out genetic differences in the DNA. And it, this is harder to do in mice and certainly in, in humans. So we don't know. However, a, a, um, I think it makes sense. It's just a, too good of a trick not to be reinvented or, or conserved. So I'm hopeful, hopeful that it will exist in humans. And I can also tell you that other discoveries that were made in C. elegans in these nematodes were found to be um, conserved also in humans, many discoveries. Um, so uh, so, uh, so I, I, I hope that it is conserved, but I, I can't know. And, and people will study it, but it's a challenge even just to think of how to design the experiment and to do the study. I'm sure this will happen, but it could take a lot of time. And I just have to uh, remind the audiences that also regular genetics started with work on different model organisms. So uh, the, the rules of inheritance were discovered in peas, in plants, and many, many years before DNA was even known to be the genetic material. And then later they were discovered, the, the, the rules were elucidated in, in uh, flies and bacteria and viruses. And it took a lot of time, a, lot, a long, long time until it, it became clear that this is also happening in humans because it's just much easier to study these type of simple organisms. Just like if you want to understand um, uh, physics and you want to understand the, um, the atom, you want to start with hydrogen, not with a super complicated molecule that contains many, many, many different elements. How long do you think before you're able to do this on mice? Are, are mice the next step and then humans? Or are there many things in between mice and then studying it on humans? Yeah, I think there are, there are things in between, but people nevertheless already studied this in humans and in mice. It's just that the, the, these are very difficult experiments, but they improve all the time in their techniques and their uh, experimental designs. And some things already uh, show promise. Also, there are many examples of transgenerational effects that were seen in higher organisms and all kinds of epigenetic effects. Epigenetic means um, something that is inherited not 
through the DNA sequence, but in another way. And there are examples for this also in, uh, in, in humans. It's just unclear how it happens. With worms, we know how these small RNAs transmit the information between generations, and we know a lot about the mechanisms, so it's, harder, it's easier to study it, also easier to believe. In humans, it's unclear. So, for example, uh, there are studies, ep huge epidemiological studies on the Dutch famine, this period where the Nazis in, um, uh, starved uh, or sieged a large population in the Netherlands. They didn't get enough food for uh, close to six months. So these people in, 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 the, in the Netherlands had a ratio of, of, uh, of calories per day. It was, I think, 800 calories or something like this per day for a long time. And it was shown that their descendants suffer from all kinds of um, um, diseases that are probably result from this starvation and not because of changes to their DNA. Some so sometime, some kind of epigenetic uh, effect is, is, uh, is happening there, but it's not clear how and why. And for, so, for example, they, the descendants, the, 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 the kids and also the grandkids suffer more from... Uh, from uh, diabetes and all, also from all kinds of neurological diseases. Um, so, uh, so this sounds very relevant to what we're uh, studying, but it's not clear whether it's the same mechanism and whether it's also a true epigenetic effect because we just have to wait a little longer. These studies were very good because they studied thousands of people. However, they only examined the, 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 the kids and the grandkids, not the grand-grandkids. And so... It, it, it's impossible to rule out the possibility that the descendants that they examined were directly affected by the starvation of their parents because uh, the woman that was uh, starved already had the, the baby in the womb and the baby already had germ cells. So in fact, two generations down the road were directly affected by the starvation. Whether this moves on to, the next, to an additional generation that, wasn't, that didn't experience the original starvation uh, we don't know. We have to wait for the for these uh, grand grandkids to be analyzed, and if it would affect them, then we will know that this is a true epigenetic effect, and we will have to understand how, because obviously it's connected to diseases and extremely important. Well, certainly there are uh, other examples of, of humans abusing other, other humans uh, other than the Nazis here in in <laughs> in the Netherlands. You know, is is this a unique thing? Has this has been shown? elsewhere in the world, or is there something unicum about the situation here? Right, no, no. I, I, I'm, yes, certainly there are many kinds of abuse and uh, traumas and, and bad things uh, uh, that are being done everywhere. The questions of whether they can leave an imprint, a transgenerational imprint, is still unknown. We, because we just don't, uh, just don't know enough. But it's, it's very important because if you look at, uh, if you want to understand diseases, and there is information that transmits not in the DNA, so it means that genetic analysis wouldn't be enough. We have to look beyond that. Uh, what is being inherited in humans and how is just, you know, completely uncharted grounds and will need to be studied. I still think that it's, it's important to start in these very simple uh, organisms because there we know what we're measuring and we know what we are, uh, um, the manipulations that we that we do, which is of course completely unethical to do in in, uh, in humans. And and then you can start with the mechanism. You can start to ask whether the same mechanisms that allow this transmission of information epigenetically exist also in humans, irrespectively of of the manipulation. You can just look at the mechanism and ask, does it exist? And I think this is a very important step that that need to happen uh, next. Because one would have to assume that the Nazis treated prisoners in concentration camps much worse than this uh, Dutch population that was uh, simply maybe under siege and not given enough food. So were the survivors, I guess you, you don't know, or I guess we don't know, were the survivors of concentration camps who were, who were on the brink of death many uh, occasion, uh, if they weren't killed, were, were their descendants uh, showing uh, things like this? Or, or no one has looked at that. Yeah, so people looked a little bit uh, on on the on uh, the descendants of of uh, of uh, people that were in the Holocaust and tried to see whether they suffered from all kinds of problems. And indeed, people did these type of studies. The problem is that it's very very hard to interpret because you have all kinds of confounding factors. For example, it is obvious that. There was also an uh, uh, effect of, of learning and uh, education. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, 
people that uh, if if your parents were in the holocaust and they they often tell you to finish your food from the plate and they carry psychological uh, um trauma and affect you when you grow that affect you when you grow up um, which is not uh, related to the biological changes disentangling the two is extremely difficult nature from nurture and also people are very different genetically so you can't know whether this is because of the genetic differences or because of the trauma of the parents so experiments like this are being done but they are very problematic um, methodology me, from the methodology uh, aspect and also statistically often they are very weak because too f- few people are examined to understand these complex, complex traits and complex effects we need to study thousands of people and this hasn't been done yet is there music playing at your lab or at home what's what's your musical life like what this this is talking beats after all we always cover music <laughs> somewhat because it plays a role in everybody's life what is it for you yeah, music is extremely important for me. I'm also interested in studying music a little bit. But uh, but music is always playing, uh, you know, of course, in my car when I drive, but also at home and also in the lab. The the, the, the students uh, uh, play. I even have a musician student, a student who now quit his PhD to become a professional uh, musician. Uh, and I I love music. I, I listen to it all the time and, uh, and think about it all the time. And it's also very inspirational aside from just being fun um, not just the music itself and enjoying music but also the, the lives of the musicians is extremely uh, influential just the other day last week or so I watched the the documentary about the Beastie Boys and the way that they and this is very very inspiring the way that they you know these Jewish kids uh, who nevertheless uh, were so uh, uh, free in their life choices and also risk it all Time and time again, they switch styles and um, and didn't settle. So that's very inspiring. Um, so yeah, mu- music is, is everywhere and is really important to me. I wonder, given the geographic, the political situation, the context that Israel is in in the Middle East, I wonder, in terms of collaborations, let's just ignore the 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 pandemic for the time being, just in pre-pandemic times. Oh, were collaborations happening with? Uh, any colleagues in the Arab world, and do maybe think some of the recent uh, peace agreements uh, between Israel and uh, certain Arab countries would open the door, or are you always looking towards Europe uh, and America? Yeah, um, I certainly hope that the uh, situation improves and these new peace deals and everyone in Israel now going to Dubai and so on. Um, uh, in my lab, I have uh, a Muslim students also, uh, but uh, with other countries, there are some grants that encourage collaborations between um, uh, Israelis and, and uh, scientists from other uh, Arab countries and uh, uh, collaborations with the Germany that are involved also. Uh, I, I hope the situation would improve. Um, I think scientists are a little bit isolated from that, and which is very good, From I mean, from the troubles of the of the area, There's, uh, like science is something that uh, unites us, and we don't really care with whom we work, as long as uh, their science is interesting. Um, I, I, I think that the political situation is, of course, uh, influencing Israel. And if it, it wasn't for the political situation, we would have a lot more foreign scientists coming to Israel. We have a few postdocs and and uh, um, and students, but but not compa- but compared to the level of the science, which is extremely high, we have just a few. I'm sure that if the political situation uh, uh, would improve, we would also attract scientists from all over the world in much higher amounts. You've mentioned viruses before, right at the beginning of this conversation. Uh, the the COVID nineteen is is here he here to stay. Although Israel is doing a re- remarkable job at uh, vaccinating its population, you, uh, you you're a young man and you'll probably get it soon. Um, but uh, it is here to stay. It's part of our lives. Uh, we're never going to forget this period of time. Uh, what do you think is is going to happen with uh, future generations? Of course, the the obvious answer is you don't know it has to be studied but do you have any conjectures based on past pandemics or past viruses or, or how concerned are you about the imprint this is going to leave on the future i think that uh, that's a that's a great question and um indeed israel is, is doing a good job vaccinating people 
But I think that this and this will leave a, a psychological imprint for sure on, on the kids of today that don't go to school and also on us. Um, I think that the, the biology of the virus is, is, I mean, it's not that mysterious. This is why it was also, the, the vaccines were made so fast because at the end it's, it's a part of a larger family of viruses that we, that we understand and we know how to create vaccines. But I think there are still mysteries, big mysteries regarding the biology of viruses that need to be understood. And I'm very intrigued by that. So, for example, why are we, humanity, inflicted with viruses, with huge, with huge uh, pandemics that wipe out a, a large part of the population every about 100 years or so? Why is it every 100 years and not every five years? Um, what are these cycles? I think these are huge questions that we don't understand. Um, I think also the psychological uh, aspects of how we deal with it as a society needs to be studied because the situation could have been handled a lot faster and a lot better. The science world did its job. The vaccines were made in less than a year. That is incredible. And also in Israel, they are distributed very fast, not because of, by the way, the government, but because of the socialists who built the, the country a long time ago that built up the infrastructure to do it. But we, the, we, I think, that of course, we need to study the biology of it, but we also need to, to study how we handle it psychologically and as a culture uh, and why we're so bad at handling it. In, in Israel, for example, we're not an island, but we, are, we have one, uh, pretty much uh, one airport that uh, connects us to the world. This could have been stopped very fast, uh, but, uh, but, we are, but, but we suck at it. We, we, we let it, we, we totally destroy us. You know, this is a very simple virus. The genetic instructions are extremely short uh, and still it makes a fool out of us. So it's, it's humbling, but also it makes me, I, I think um, it's a good time to be a biologist. And for example, this year, more students than ever signed up to my course. I had 750 students sign up to my genetics course, which is much more than usual because I think people are seeing how relevant biology is and how interesting it is and that this is, this is really the future and that we need to invest more uh, in it. What do you have to say to people who, who would say, well, I'm skeptical of the vaccine. We don't know what it's going to do and it, uh, it, it was developed too quickly. What is your response I think, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so don't sue me later, but definitely, <laughs> but, but definitely go, go, go uh, get the vaccine. Um, there, there's already information from millions of people around the world that it is safe. It is extremely rare. I'm not even aware of, uh, of, of um, side effects that occur in vaccination after many years. This doesn't happen. The effects that you get, like an allergic attack and so on, they are, they are seen immediately after you get the vaccine. And we don't see this. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's extremely rare. It's as safe as other, as other vaccines, which change the world and is the greatest invention ever. Uh, it's our best ch uh, chance against the viruses and people should go and run. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the other option of getting corona is very bad. This is a really bad disease. Uh, and when you get corona, there's, it's certainly possible that there will be also late effects that we'll, also, we'll only see in many years. Um, they say that, that there's damage to, uh, to uh, the lungs and possibly even to uh, reproductive uh, organs and, and the brain. So when you, when you just consider the risk, um, vaccines are a million times safer. So definitely go, say, go, uh, go, go get vaccinated if you can, as soon as you can. As you look towards the future, what are you looking forward to working on in the next five, ten years? Is, is this virus going to sort of color everything that you do going forward in a way or are you going to be able to escape it i'm very hopeful that i will be able to escape it because the 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 the, the scientific answers that are used today to deal with the virus were uh, mo in most cases were gained many many years ago of course there are some uh, studies that help design the vaccines and help us prepare but 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 the the, the basic science that led to the, to the answers was done many, many years ago. And we need to prepare for the next thing that will attack us that could uh, arise in, in, uh, in 100 years. And there are many open biological questions that I'm much more interested in studying. How the brain works, how memory works, uh, how metamorphosis works. Uh, um, so I, I, there are many, many big questions that we, are, we don't understand and interest, in, interest me much more than, than, uh, the, what, uh, than dealing with this virus. The virus is important for our day-to-day -day life, but it's not, where the, the, it's not the cutting edge of science, in my opinion. What's going to happen when there's a really complicated virus that's hard to sequence? Is this something, is this something that can happen? I mean, do, do you expect it to happen that, that, that while this is a 
a biologically simple virus. There could be one uh, that is quite complex, quite difficult to understand, to sequence, to find a vaccine for. Yeah, so and, and, and definitely there are things we don't understand. There are things that are uh, that cause diseases which are not viruses and also spread. For example, there was the mad cow disease, which is mediated by a, a protein that leads to a heritable change. And this is something that is poorly understood when it was just shown in the 80s that the, the, the causative agent is a, is a, which leads to the disease is a protein uh, that uh, leads to this uh, heritable effect and not a, a, a DNA or RNA. People, would, no one believed it. After many years, they, they were awarded Prusner, the discovery with the Nobel Prize because it was so new. And when it started to spread out, people were totally panicking because we didn't know how to handle it. We didn't know how to neutralize it. So, for example, these type of, uh, of effects, which are mediated by prions, these heritable uh, proteins, um, are poorly understood, super scary, and we don't have the we don't have a vaccine for that or a way to handle it now. So I think that uh, this is just one example. Another example of an effect that spreads and we don't know how to stop it is antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is a huge problem. Also, we have just a few types of uh, of uh, antibiotics, uh, and and bacteria certain bacteria uh, develop their resistance to these antibiotics, and if they spread, we are completely helpless. And this is something that every uh, biologist know about is about to, to uh, uh, happen at some point. We'll have to deal with it. And there the biology is poorly understood and we, we need to do a much better job of developing the basic science that will lead to, to the solutions. With, with viruses, uh, and we don't have all the answers uh, and there, 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 is, there, is a numer there are numerous amounts of viruses and they are very, very different. But biology is very complicated and diverse and, and every aspect of it needs to be studied. We like talking about the fun stuff, about the happy stuff, about the joyful stuff around here, but we also like talking about the things that make you lose sleep overnight. You wake up in the middle of the night worrying. What is it about? Hmm. Yeah, so you know, so of course I do. I wake up worrying about many things. Uh, uh, the situation of the world in these uh, times is a very worrying, but this is these are worries that are shared with everyone. I mean, in the... In a typical night, when I worry, I worry about my research, about you know losing the creativity or the drive to 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 try new things. Uh, these are the type of things that worry me. Um, uh, other things are too scary, <laughs> <laughs> you know, worrying about the health of uh, of uh, my family and so on. This is just um, uh, this. I hope just to suppress these type of uh, dreams. But dreams about uh, about creativity, about uh, scientific challenges, are dreams that motivate you. So I prepare to I pr I prefer focusing on on this. When I ask you about what you're going to be working on the next five to ten years, uh, w what is it that is a challenge right now? When when we get off this conversation, you you're going to run back to the lab, or or what 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 are you in the middle of right now? Yeah, so uh, there are many open questions that relate to um, to inheritance. Still, what are the limits of inheritance? Can we just Think of something to affect the heritable materials, the ep epigenetics. These are the type of things that we start try to study in worms. But I'm also interested in how the brain works in general, and I'm shifting more and more to thinking about that. Um, how cognitive uh, processes in the in the brain work, how memory works, the the um, what leads to uh, irrational decision making. We've been studying this also in worms a little bit. We've, uh, you know, uh, there, there, there are these uh, studies that led also to the Nobel Prize by Kahneman and Tversky, which showed that humans behave irrationally. We don't maximize our choices. And this was also shown in many other um, organisms, uh, in mice, in flies, in bees, in birds. We did, uh, we showed that also worms think irrationally. And uh, when I say irrationally, I talk about... Uh, economic choices, which is a, a very uh, specific type of irrationality, which is very relevant to our lives as humans also. Why do we make poor choices? And while Kahneman and, Tam Kahneman and Tversky uh, uh, describe these phenomena, and they certainly exist, and they show that we are irrational in our choices, it wasn't clear why. And to explain why, we invoke all kinds of psychological es explanations. We say that we made a bad choice because of, uh, I don't know, regret or cognitive load or all kinds, kinds of words like that, which are, which is, are very hard to, 
to tease apart. But we've shown that in worms, when we let the worms choose between different things, like different odors of food, sometimes they make irrational decisions, but we can understand them at the neurological level. So the worm has just 302 neurons. We have many billions of them. And in the worm, each neuron has a name. So we can actually know which neurons work and how. And we can uh, uh, try to understand the, the, the rules of the circuit, how, how they compute, how they make the, the, choi- the decisions at the level of the neurons. And we, we showed when worms behave irrationally and how we can fix it by genetically engineering the worms to have their brain wired in a different way. But what do you way. mean worms behaving irrationally? I mean, that sounds very silly to me. <laughs> what, 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 are you, what are you talking right, right. about? So I'll explain <laughs> it. So normally when you say someone is irrational, you mean it in a very abstract way. Here I'm talking at the economical level, at the way that you uh, maximize the value of your choices. Let me uh, give you an example. Um, If you prefer uh, uh, an apple over an orange, okay, you prefer apples over orange, they're more tasty to you. Um, It shouldn't matter whether I also give you, say also, you can can also choose a pear. What does it matter? You always prefer the apples over oranges, right? But it was shown, again, these are the studies by Kahneman, Tversky and others, that if you have now another alternative, the pear, although it's completely unrelated, maybe you hate pears, it can change your preference. Suddenly you'll prefer oranges over apples. Why, why do you do this? Why are you inconsistent in your choices? This is something that affects everything that we do. Okay? And it, it is described, and there are many violations of economic rationality that are known to psychologists now and economists for many years. The question is, why do we make these mistakes? Why are we inconsistent? When I say worms make irrational choices, what I mean is we let the worms choose between an odor. Worms like to smell things. They can smell thousands of odors. So we let them choose between order A and order B. And they prefer order A over B. So they go towards A and not towards B. But then we show that in certain cases, when we add an order C, it will make them change their preference. Suddenly they prefer B over A. Why? The thing is that in worms, unlike in humans, with the example of the pears and apples and so on, we can really study and understand how it happens. Because we know that odor A that the worm smelled is sensed just by one particular neuron that we know its name. And we know that odor B is sensed by another neuron, and odor C that we can add or not add is sensed by another odor, by another neuron. And so by manipulating the different choices of the worm, and the neurons that are activated by each uh, choice, by, by each smell that we, by each odor that we let the worm smell, which we, we have found conditions where the worm make mistakes, where they suddenly lose the, cons- uh, the uh, consistency and behave irrationally based on this definition of the economist. And we, we then understood how the activation of the nervous system by the different choices leads to irrationality. And we found a very, very simple uh, rule, which is a sort of a short circuit type of rule. We found that whenever the third choice interferes with the sensation of the, fir- of the, of the first choice, more than it inter- interferes with the neuronal activity, the sensation of the second choice, then the worms will be confused and behave irrationally according to this definition. And we can then in- genetically engineer the worms to give the certain neurons that smell odor A more power or more bandwidth to deal with the sensation and fix its irrationality. Or we can lower the bandwidth of the neurons and make them more irrational. So we can really play with it. And the the conclusion of this study is fascinating because it's really far-reaching. What what it tells us that normally when we think about irrationality, we we think it must come because of these higher brain brain cognitive functions or because of uh, you know complicated compu- computations that we do or emotions or things like that where in fact as the example in worms show it could stem from much simpler limits of the way that neurons are built from just it's called bounded rationality just because of we have uh, we have certain limitations of the way that neurons fire and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be because of emotions or things like that. So if you think about it, this is really um, makes you think, and uh, it's it's very fascinating. And also, then, I mean, you think, how, how do we appreciate the music? Why do we enjoy this music or that music? These are all type of things that fascinate me. Well, I look forward to the day when I can uh, come to the lab, take a tour, and uh, see see with a microscope the C elegance and uh, and and query you in person about all of this. Uh, it is whenever you're in Israel, you're invited always. <laughs> <laughs>
I appreciate it. It is indeed fascinating and uh, fast moving. Oded Rechavi, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk. The original theme music is by Ronald Barkham. The content coordinator is Nathaniel Mose, and Doug Christian is executive producer. We invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can support us at patreon.com slash talkingbeats. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash talkingbeats. And be sure to check us out on social media. We'll see you next time on Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk.